It is very good to be with you all here this morning, and I appreciate the warm reception to your church. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to meet uh, all of you and get a chance to speak with you all and, and, and hang out and looking forward to soul winning this afternoon. And uh, again, I appreciate the, the warm welcome and, and you know, Pastor Shelley's not here, but a special thanks to him also for uh, setting us up so kindly in a hotel and uh, we're able to actually get breakfast at our hotel, which these days is kind of rare, it seems, because of all the COVID craziness. So um, it's good to be here. The sermon I'm preaching this morning is one that I was actually planning on preaching at Stronghold Baptist Church. And this morning, it's just a very, it's a very doctrinal sermon, okay? This is very, uh, I call it, I think it's simple. But oftentimes, we need to be refreshed with simple doctrines and make sure that we get it all nailed down. And I was speaking with Pastor Shelley about this yesterday because I have multiple ideas for sermons and um, the ones that I wanted to, to preach, you know, kind of what's been sitting on my heart for a while. There's been a lot of, you know, there's, there's always things going on online. I'm sure people here follow other churches and listen to other preachers and, and kind of hear uh, different things that are going on. And so many times fundamental doctrines are just continue to get attacked, right? So it's important that we go back and just cover some of the, the groundwork on these doctrines and make sure that we're all clear. And the title of my sermon this morning is Being Born Again. Now, being born again is extremely simple doctrine. When you get, you know, when you're saved, you are born again, right? We're born of the Spirit. And in John chapter 3, you know, Jesus explaining to Nicodemus about being born again. Hey, you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus didn't understand that. And he says, look, you're supposed to be a master of Israel and you don't even know these things, right? It's real basic, real fundamental. Now, I'm not talking just about being saved this morning. I'm not going to be preaching this on being saved, um, particularly just, just, you know, salvation being born again. But I am going to be preaching on how a person gets saved, meaning, you know, it, it's from a soul winner bringing the gospel and preaching the gospel to another person. And there's been a lot of, I think, confusion and people spread, you know, there's lots of different ideas on, well, can the word of God itself just, just save you? If someone's just reading a Bible, if someone's just reading, you know, like a track or whatever, is that going to get a person saved? And I'm going to present evidence to you this morning that, the, that I believe, and we're going to see through the abundance of scripture, that the Bible emphasizes people to go forth, to bear the precious seed to, to reproduce and bring forth fruit in other people of people being born again through that process of human beings bringing, you know, working together with God to bring forth other believers in Jesus Christ. And that that is the model that God follows and that you know, example after example after example is going to show us that this is what God intended. And hopefully by the end you're going to see that, you know, um, that this is the truth that you do need people that God, God requires us to go forth and preach the gospel. Amen. And if nobody did that, nobody would be getting saved. Right. Yeah. And I could understand where you might start to make this, especially from a chapter like this. So let's, let's start reading here in first Peter chapter one. We're going to reread some of this. Um, sorry. In verse number 18. Bible reads, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I'm going to pause right there. These verses, 18 through 23, are saying a lot of things. Obviously, Jesus Christ is the Savior, Amen. right? So we go out and preach the gospel. We're not the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Right? We're going out and burying this precious seed. We're burying the seed of the word, but it's the word of God that has the power. Yeah. We are the vessels that are going to bring that word of God. And when you read chapters like this, I could understand where you could say like, well, I mean, since it's Jesus, since it's the word of God, then maybe that alone is good enough for salvation, right? Because I mean, I could, I could see how you could come up with that. 
But here's the thing, we're going to find over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture, and there's, there's an abundance of, of passages that explain that while, of course, this is true, and when we go out and, and win souls to Christ, the glory isn't on us, it's not on us as human beings, and it's not our words, and it's not our own power, but that that job has been given unto us, and that that's the way that God designed it to be. So he still gets all the glory. He gets all the honor. Saving comes from him, but it's not unbiblical at all to say that we got somebody saved. And the reason why it's important to dig into this doctrine is because when you start tearing it away, you, it's going to lead you to worse and worse false doctrine. So it's not the worst thing in the world for someone to believe that, well, if someone read the Bible, they might be able to get saved. Okay, that's not, like I said, it's not the worst thing to just believe that. And I'm not even going to argue with people necessarily too hard on, on that point. But what happens then is they take this doctrine and saying, oh, well, I mean, it's just the word of God. So that way, if there's, if there's some false prophet out there and they're just repeating the gospel, now people could get saved through these false prophets because, hey, it's the word of God. They're hearing the word of God and they're hearing all this stuff. Look, I heard the word of God growing up in church my whole life and I never got saved Amen. Wow. I mean it it happens all the time right. yeah. how many people do you run into that go to all kinds of different churches out there that could be using the King James Bible yeah. but they're not getting saved are they do you run into these people no you need to explain to them the gospel. They need to help them to understand. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because, again, there's, there's so much in Scripture that teaches this fundamental truth. But it's important to get this nailed down so we understand why. And as we continue reading here, so look, Jesus Christ, it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. God raised him up, his resurrection, it's faith in his blood, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. Absolutely, the word of God is what we're putting our faith in. So we're trusting him. We're trusting in Jesus. Jesus is the word. We're trusting in him. We're trusting in, in, in what God has given us. Absolutely. But here's the thing is that, you know, there needs to be a preacher for people to hear the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. And even as we keep reading here, verse 24 says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth and flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And I have, I probably won't have time to get to this. And I didn't want to scare you all. If you saw how many pages I have with me <laughs> this morning, you'd be like, Pastor Burns, when are we getting out of here? I'm glad there's a clock up there so I could pay attention to the time. If there's time, I'm going to read these. This is New Testament references to the gospel. Just the word, the guys did a word search for gospel. Over three pages in every single one of these. Gospel and preach. Yeah. Gospel preach. Right. Gospel preach. Yeah. Gospel preach. Yeah. Gospel preach. Right. Gospel preach. Gospel preach. Gospel preach. Gospel preach. Gospel preach. Yeah. What are we supposed to do with the gospel? We're supposed to preach the gospel. Amen. Right. And and like I said, I, I'm going to try to blow through all these verses verbally, but I've got just there's very few verses. I cut out the ones where it's just a reference to the gospel that doesn't reference speaking, preaching. Going for, you know, where it's just a reference to the gospel kind of generically, right? As just talking about the gospel. Yeah. Almost every single time in scripture in the New Testament you see the word gospel, it's tied in the very same verse with it being preached. Preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to preach. And how do you preach? You open up your mouth and you preach the gospel. Right. Now, I'm not going to get hung up on the silly, oh, well, what if someone can't hear? What if they're deaf, right? Look. A person with the Spirit of God is going to help explain that to them through whatever means of communication you need to do in order to help them understand. But at the end of the day, it's somebody getting involved in showing somebody else the truth. Amen. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. And the title is Being Born Again because... Not only when we receive Christ are we born again by that incorruptible seed. And when you're born again, you have a new spirit that's born within you. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 that that new man 
right? That, that whosoever, whatsoever is born of God doth not commit sin, right? So that uncorruptible seed that brings forth that new spirit within you, you can read 1 John chapter 3 later, but what that's talking about, it's not saying, you know, obviously we know everyone here that's put their faith in Jesus Christ knows that they're saved, but you know you still struggle with sin, right? It's because we have a dual nature. After you're saved, you've got the spirit of God, right? You've got that new man that's been born inside of you, but you still have this old flesh. And the old flesh is going to drive you to sin, whereas the spirit's going to drive you to, to serve God and please God and do what's right. And it's, it, there's such a dichotomy that our flesh cannot do good. Our flesh is only going to drive us into sin, whereas the spirit cannot sin. It's only going to do good. So we've got this battle and struggle every day. And the reason why that spirit can't sin is because it comes from the incorruptible seed. It comes from that word of God. It comes from something that cannot be defiled. And that new birth is, is without sin, which is also why when you die physically here, when your body passes away, your spirit's going to go up to heaven. There's no sin in your spirit, right? You're going straight up to be with the Lord because there is no, you know, the, the flesh is, is uh, going to stay here until one day we get a new body, right? When Jesus Christ comes back, that body's going to be changed and that will be glorified and sinless and perfect as our spirit is already. Um, but that's us. That's our salvation. But what's interesting is that that whole concept of being born again also applies to the person who's preaching the gospel so that not only are we being born again by the word of God, you're being born again by the, by the soul winner who's bringing you the word of God. Yeah. And this is taught very clearly in scripture. First right. Corinthians chapter four, look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. So apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth and referring to them as his beloved sons. Let's keep reading for though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, right? There's many instructors in Christ. There's many preachers, there's many pastors, many teachers, there's all kinds of people that teach you the word of God. And he's telling the church at Corinth, he says, look, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He's explaining, look, it's my work. I went forth. I was bearing the precious seed. I preached the gospel unto you. And that's how you got saved, which is why he's more than just an instructor for them. He's like a father for them. Spiritually speaking, he, he labored and traveled, and, and the, the, the illustration is, is just like a woman labors and travails before giving birth to a human being. The soul winner is laboring and traveling with the word of God to plant that seed, to, to help that person understand so that new birth could come forth. Amen. So there is work that's required for salvation. It's not of the person getting saved. Right? That's not of works. That's a free gift. You just have to receive that gift. The work comes from Jesus Christ. The work came from him. He needed to work on the cross. And then the work comes from the soul winner bringing the word of God and pointing them to Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's that labor and that travail. And once that happens, you know, people are, and this is, you know, the church at Corinth in, in the previous chapters, they had a lot of problems, and they had a problem with lifting up certain people and say, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, right? And he, he explains, like, look, is Christ divided? No, of course not. We all should be following Christ. But also, you know, the church of Corinth, they shouldn't be having these different heads, right? When the apostle Paul is the one who got that whole church started because he's the one that traveled there and preached the gospel and got him saved. He's like, look, you should be followers of me. You'd be listening to me because I got you saved, right? I, like, if, if you're going to have any doubts or wonder, and this is, you know, part of this has to go with, you know, the person who's leading you to Christ, you ought to be able to trust that they're saved, yeah. right? That they're not a false prophet. Right. Yeah. If they're the one who led you to Christ. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is what the Apostle Paul is teaching him here. Look, I, like, I've begotten you. There's going to be false teachers and false prophets, but you know what? The one who, who leads you to Christ, you could, have, you, could, you could trust in that that person that labored and traveled. Um, as, if you're saved, you could, you could know that they're saved as well. Yeah. Amen. 
Verse number 16, he says, and that's why he says, uh, let's read 15 again. He says, for though you have 10,000 instructors of Christ, ye have not made fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He look, follow me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. But I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in power, is not in word, excuse me. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? And he's speaking to this church as his children. Right? He's saying, look, do you want me to come in love, or do you want me to come with the rod? And he's taking responsibility for them. Why? Because he's the one who led them to Christ. And he's taking that responsibility and that ownership of saying, now I need to teach and train these people. And I'm teaching you good doctrine and I'm showing you the right way. And I want you to be followers of me as I follow Christ. Philemon chapter one, another reference we have. The apostle Paul referring to someone that he's begetting, bringing forth in birth. Philemon one, of course, there's only one, one chapter. Philemon verse number 10 the Bible reads, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. So while the Apostle Paul was imprisoned, he's still preaching the gospel to people and he gets Onesimus saved. Now look, the Apostle Paul wasn't married. Right. Yeah. And he wasn't fornicating and having children out of wedlock, especially in a prison. Right. Yeah. So it's not like he had this physical son Onesimus in prison. Right. He's begotten Onesimus spiritually. Now, we can't just say, oh, well, this, it's just using that term. Look, there's a reason why it's using that terminology and saying, look, he's begotten. Yeah. Because right. he's brought forth another soul, another creature that, that, that's believed on Christ. Yeah. He has reproduced himself. He has brought forth that fruit using the word of God. Absolutely, you can only use the word of God. Pointing him to Jesus Christ because he's the only savior. But that labor and travail and that new birth came because Paul invested the time and 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 preach to that person and brought forth another another christian another believer on the lord jesus christ he says i've begotten in my bonds which in time past was to thee unprofitable and now profitable to thee and me whom i have sent again the, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels again just just one more reference to he's bringing forth this person galatians chapter 4 another reference from the apostle paul of traveling in this new birth by him by him preaching the gospel yeah. galatians chapter 4 verse number 17 the bible reads they zealously affect you but not well yea they would exclude you that ye might affect them but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when i am present with you look at verse number nine now in the context of this chapter and in galatians He's starting to question and doubt the church of Galatia because they've allowed this works-based salvation to come into the church. So that's why Galatians chapter 1, he's just saying, look, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you've received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you've received, let him be accursed. Because what's, been, what's happened in the church of Galatia is that there's people coming in saying, oh, no, you've got to be circumcised. Oh, no, you've got to keep the law and believe. And they're getting, you know, swept up in this to the point to where the Apostle Paul is starting to doubt their salvation. Like, did you guys even get, did you even understand it to begin with when I preached unto you? Because how could you be tolerating this? And this is where he's saying that, you know, um, I stand in doubt of you. But let's, let's keep reading here. So he's saying, they zealously affect you, but not well, verse 17. He's saying, they're, yeah, they're real zealous towards this and they're affecting you, but they're not, they're not, <laughs> it's not a good thing. You're not being affected very well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Verse 18, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Verse 19, my little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He said, I'm traveling in birth. Look, I, 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 need, I need to bring you forth as babes unto Christ. I'm traveling in birth again until Christ be formed in you because I don't think that Christ is formed in you. So now I got travail in birth again until I could know that Christ has been formed in you. He says, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. 
So he's writing to them going, look, I just want to be there with you so that I can, you know, just have it fully confirmed that, yes, you are saved. Because right now I'm standing in doubt of you. Yeah. Right now I'm writing to you and feeling like I have to travail in birth again. I thought I had done it already the first time, but apparently it didn't work if you're receiving all this works-based salvation nonsense yeah. and you're following the voice of someone who's not the shepherd. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So, you know, he goes on, and, and obviously a lot of excellent passages of the book of Galatians regarding salvation just through faith, not of works, not according to the law, because he's dealing with that at that church. But the part that I'm focusing on is just that traveling in birth, right? Multiple times we're seeing that there's a birth process, not just for yourself personally being born again of a new birth, a new creature, but of, of someone else who's already saved traveling and working to bring forth that birth. Now, in general in Scripture, and you, you know, if you don't believe me on this, you could look it up for yourself. Um, there's only so many things you could prove in one sermon. When people bring forth physical seed, it's called bearing fruit. It's called being fruitful. Even to, yeah. going back to Genesis, be right. fruitful and multiply yeah. is, what, is what God said to Adam and Eve replenish the earth bring forth people there's you know with sarah and rebecca they're you know told hey you know god hope god blesses you that you're fruitful and that you have you know that you're the mother of of, of nations and thousands of of, of people you know and, and that um that they're blessed to, to bring forth fruit the bible says that the um the fruit of the womb is his reward yeah. Yeah. so that's 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 reproduction so over and over and over again, we're seeing fruit being brought forth. The reason why this is so important is because this is how you can determine whether or not a person is a false prophet. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going way, way, way out of order in my notes, but that's okay. It makes sense to cover this right now. While you're turning to Matthew chapter 7, you know, the, the concept of, of bringing forth and traveling in birth again, people don't like to hear that. Some people don't like to hear that because they say, oh, well, that's putting too much emphasis on you. No, it's putting emphasis on where the Bible puts emphasis. Obviously, right. when we bring forth fruit, we're, bringing, we're putting emphasis on Jesus Christ. Right. Okay, when we're preaching the gospel, the, the, the emphasis is on him. Yeah. It's not on, hey, I'm here to do this. You know, right. I don't know anybody who does that. Right. That's not what we're doing. But what we're doing today is we're understanding clear doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and this is the truth. And, it's, and, and there's no, you know, I don't blush. I'm not ashamed to say that the soul winner, a human being, has a part in people getting saved. Because right. absolutely you do. I mean, we're not Calvinists here. Right. We don't think that it's just, oh, it's just all of a sudden, it's just going to happen. I mean, if God wills it that people will be saved, they'll just get saved. Yeah. No. God wants people to be saved. But you know what? People don't get saved because there's other people that are not out preaching the gospel. You know, there's that, that parable of the sower and the seed, right? Again, just like we saw in 1 Peter chapter 1, we're born again of the incorruptible seed. But you know what? Don't forget that part about the parable of the sower and the seed is that there's a sower right. that went forth to sow, Yeah. right? What, what's going to happen to that seed if there's not a sower going forth to sow? Yeah. The seed's not going anywhere. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The seed's just staying put. And there's going to be no new life coming from a barrel of seed that's just stored away in a storehouse somewhere. It's not even going to be cast on stony ground. I mean, it's not going to be anywhere. Some sower needs to go forth sowing that seed. There's references in Scripture to, you know, saving people. That's why the Bible says in Jude, of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear. Right? We're supposed to go out and save people. 1 Corinthians 9.22 says, To the weak became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I made all things all men, that I might by all means save some. And of course, the Bible says it very, very famous, Proverbs 11, 30, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. There's a very personal connection with people getting saved. Very personal connection. Laboring is bringing forth a child, doing what it takes for people to get saved, and being the instrument by which those people can get saved. And understanding that fruit, I had you turn to Matthew chapter 7, 
Jesus Christ taught, he was teaching his disciples, he said, beware of false prophets, verse number 15, Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. And this passage has been so butchered and abused by so many different people, I think most just don't understand what this is teaching at all because they're not reading it and just believing for what it says, okay? People will take this and say, oh, you're known by the fruits, and they just want to apply it to everybody, every single person. Is this person even saved? Well, I'm going to know them by their fruits. Is that what he said? You're going to know who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ by their fruits? Is that what this passage says? No, because it says, beware of false prophets, ye shall know them by their fruits. So what is he talking about you're going to know by their fruits? The false prophet. Is every unbeliever a false prophet? No. Is everybody a prophet? No, right? So you're going to have good prophets, bad prophets. You know, the false prophet, how are you going to identify who's a false prophet? Why? Because here's the thing. A false prophet is likened to a wolf in sheep's clothing. So outwardly, they're going to look really good, right? Which is why we can't look at, if their fruit is just, oh, what are they doing? Well, outwardly, they're going to look really good. They're going to be putting on that show. They're going to be wearing the nice clothing. They're going to come in with Bible in hand. They're going to talk the talk because they're playing the part. Yeah. Just like Judas Iscariot did. Yep. Yeah. Who Jesus said was a devil. And he knew he was a devil from the beginning. Right. There was no doubt. Jesus didn't like, oh, I don't know which one of these guys is a devil. Right. He knew it was Judas. Right. He knew it was Judas the whole time. Yeah. Give me a break. And him knowing that, okay, he was able to, that's why you can't just say, well, who's the false prophet among you? Well, let's see who's, you know, doing, you, you can't tell, they're hiding it. Right. Yeah. But the way that you're going to know is by their fruit. Because as we continue to read here, it's going to explain what, what he's even talking about. Verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So if you want something good to eat, you want to get grapes. You want to get figs, you want to get some actual physical fruit from a tree. You're not going to go to a bramble bush. You're not going to go to some, some dead, some cactus, some, you know, something that's just bearing thorns and briars to get this good fruit. That's not how it works. You go to an apple tree to get apples, right? right. Yeah. You're going to something good. You're going to get, get these grapes. You're not going to go to, to get thorns. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. I mean, it's a very simple concept. Got a good tree is bringing forth good fruit, good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. This is how we're able to know a false prophet because it is impossible. It is impossible for a corrupt tree to bring forth good fruit. Can't be done. Cannot be done. Otherwise, you're calling Jesus a liar by saying, well, how am I going to know who's a false prophet? Well, I mean, this corrupt tree was bringing forth all kinds of good fruit. How are you going to even know then? No, the only way, look, the fruit is the reproduction. Yep. Yeah. That labor in birth, that fruitful person is how you're even going to know. This is where the really bad doctrine comes in. But see, it stems from saying, oh, well, I mean, it's just the word of God. No, no one else needs to be involved. It's just if you hear the word of God by any, it doesn't matter who the person is, that's enough for people to get saved. No, it's not. Because then you would have these false prophets repeating the word of God and bringing forth good fruit. Right? Yeah, right. And here's the thing. Here's the reason why. You say, well, why is it that the word of God is powerful, you know, when this person preaches, it's not that person or whatever. Because it's not that the word of God's not powerful. It's that it's not our power that is getting someone saved. We are working jointly with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is working with us when we go out and preach the gospel. That's why you got to be walking in the spirit to go out and get people saved anyways. Yeah. If you're, if you're under your own, even as a saved person, if you're just completely under your own strength and, and God's not with you and the Holy Spirit's not with you in the sense of, obviously we're all indwelled, but, but, you know, when you're walking in the Spirit, that's when you're going to get people saved. That's right. yeah. Because it's the Holy Spirit that's working through you. Amen. 
You're working together, but, but that's where the real power comes in. Just like it's not your own words that's going to get someone saved. It's the word of God that's really, that's the precious seed being sown. But it has to come through someone bringing that Holy Ghost that the people can be partakers with the Holy Ghost in that sense to get saved. And then turn, if you would, turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So many references to the new birth, so many references to the traveling of the soul winner. But now we're going to see that this, this uh, command is given to us by God. That this is a ministry, this is a job that God has committed. The, the job of reconciling people to God. The, the job of, of burying that precious seed. The job of preaching the gospel has been committed unto believers in Jesus Christ. God has given us that job. You know why? Because God himself is not just speaking directly to people these days and trying to get them saved. It's not happening, and it's not going to happen. And this is why, I mean, you know, people say, well, what about that tribe in Africa and that long-lost jungle or whatever? You know, God's not going to send them to hell, is he? Look, God is not coming down physically to appear to those people. You know what he's done? He's appointed people to go preach the gospel to them. Right, yeah. that's, the, that's, how, that's how God solves that problem. The onus is on us to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to get people saved. Amen. And it's, again, clearly taught in scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spirituals, but, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is a Paulus? Look at this, verse 5. But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Everybody that saved... It was through a minister of the word of God by whom you believed. Because God wants everyone to be saved, and God has ordained for ministers to go out and preach the word unto every creature. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Great Commission is all about. You know, go ye forth and therefore in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That job is committed unto us. Let's keep reading here in verse number five, though. I mean, if this isn't enough. You know, hopefully the rest of this passage is, or the next passage, or the next passage, or the next passage after that, to convince you that this is how God works. Okay, this is what, this is, this is how it works, how people get saved. This is how people are born again. Absolutely, it's through the word of God. You can't get anyone saved without the word of God. But it's not the word of God exclusively. The Holy Ghost needs to be involved. It's just like the people who are saying, like, I hate hearing these false representations of what people believe and they speak in generalities. And it's like, you know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Like just come out and say who you're talking about. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, stop misrepresenting the, you know, the people who think, Oh, so if, if Jesus, all he had to do was go to hell, then why did he even do that? You know, it's like, no one's saying that all he had to do to pay for our sins was go to hell. Right. <laughs> or we're saying it's a package deal, right? And this is a whole nother doctrine. Which I'm sure you've heard about, <laughs> But it, it's, it's, it's not just the resurrection. It's not just the blood. It's not just any one thing. It's the whole package. Yeah, right. It's the, you know, the virgin birth. Yeah. It's God being manifest in the flesh. It's the perfect sinless life. It's also the healing. It's also preaching the gospel to the poor. It's also every other fulfillment of prophecy. Yeah. Amen. It's all of it. Right. Yeah. It's the crucifixion. It's the shedding of blood. It's a dying. It's being dead for three days and three nights. It's the resurrection. And you know what else it is? It's the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. Amen. That's when it was finished completely. The whole thing. His earthly ministry, earthly ministry finished when he died on the cross. But we, you have to believe it all. And the same thing with this. You can't just say, oh, well, you don't believe. Look. 
for someone to get saved, you need the perfect, incorruptible seed. Amen. You need the Savior. You need Jesus Christ. You need the Holy Spirit. You need a soul winner. Yep. Yeah. You need a minister. You need somebody to bring forth that word. Let's finish reading here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number, sorry, verse number 6 again. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Again, God gets the glory. We're not saying we're the ones that get the glory, but you know what? The planting and watering have to be there still. We go out and plant water. God's giving the increase. God gets, you know, he gets credit for salvation, like, like saving the soul. We can't ourselves of our own power save the soul, but the planting and the watering you want that seed to, to bring forth life, you got to plant and water. Yep. Verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And that's kind of funny too. I, I'm, I'm curious how the false prophet's going to earn their rewards for all the planting and watering and reaping that they did when they're in hell. Right. <laughs> I mean, it says here that, that every man shall receive his own reward. Yeah. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers with God. We're working with God. We need God. You know what? God needs us to preach the gospel. Yep. Amen. And it's not because, oh, you think God can't do it? No, he can, but that's not the way that he designed it. Yeah. I'm not saying God's incapable of anything, but if this is the way that he said it, then that's the way it is. It's bottom line. It's not taking any power away from God. God's all powerful. We know when God's not going to do something because he said so, then that's the way it is. Yeah. He's put that, that onus on us. Like I said before, ye are God's husbandry. What's husbandry? It's like, we're, like we're, the work for, we're the work animals, yeah. right? We're, we're the oxen that's bearing the yoke. But didn't Jesus say, come with me and bear the yoke with me, together with me? Right? Aren't we supposed to get in the yoke with Jesus yeah. and do the plowing? And do the work and be this laborer for the Lord and, and this work. Yeah. It's what God's called us to do. Yeah. Why? Why are we just, just going through all these motions if none of it's really necessary for people to get saved? Right. Yeah, that's true. Because it is necessary. Yeah. Yeah. We are laborers together with God. You're God's husband, you're God's building according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Look what he says, I have laid the foundation. The Apostle Paul is saying, I've laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what foundation is he laying? Jesus Christ. Yep. He's preaching Jesus Christ and him crucifying. That's the foundation. That's the foundation. That's the foundation. That's what everyone needs to be saved. That's the building that you need. And they, you know what? then you add on that building. You add good doctrine. You add good works. You add all kinds of other things on top of that foundation. But you know what? That foundation needs to be laid. Now, in one sense, it's already been laid when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead. But you know what? We need to lay that foundation in each individual person. Yeah, yeah. The foundation of Jesus Christ. This is a work that's committed unto all believers, not just the prophets that were used to give us the word of God, by the way. It's not just, oh, yeah, Isaiah was laying that foundation. You know what? He was in his day. Yeah. The Apostle Paul was laying that foundation. Yeah, he was in his day, too. But you know what? They're not out today going around and bringing forth that precious seed. It's in the word of God, which is the seed. Yeah. But it still needs to be laid. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 1. Bible reads, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If we don't go out and preach the gospel, you know, we're still saved. If our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Yeah. 
if our gospel, us taking on that ministry, us doing the job of preaching the gospel, if that's hid, meaning if we're not doing it, the Bible's saying it's hid to them that are lost. It's not saying, well, don't worry if you're not doing it because they'll still find it another way. No, if, if our gospel's hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and their, their minds are blinded by the God of this world. We need to shed forth that glorious gospel, that, that light to shine through and shine unto them. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Again, the focus isn't on us. But this doctrine needs to be understood that we are a critical part of other people getting saved. Yeah. That's right. We don't preach ourselves. We're not taking the glory. But that puts the, the, you know, the fire under us because it's important to go out and do the work. Yeah. You can't just be lazy and sit back because if your gospel is hid, it's hid to those that are lost. Right. Yeah. And you know what? God made a minister by whom you believed. How about you step in the, in the ministry seat now and start going forth and be a minister by whom other people can believe? Amen. That's right. Go to chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to start reading verse number 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. So they're saying, look, we shouldn't be living under, after you're saved, after someone, you know, you've received the gift of God, you received that eternal life by him that died and rose again from the dead. You know what? Now your job isn't just to live unto yourself. Now you ought to go and live for him, live for Christ. Let's keep reading verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Again, that new birth. Verse 18, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. When Jesus Christ was in this world, he was preaching the gospel to the lost, to the poor, to the blind. He went out healing and preaching and preaching the word of God. But you know what? That ministry was short-lived in human years on this earth physically by him. Which is why when he left, that, that ministry has been committed. Reconciling people into God has been committed unto the apostles. And then beyond the apostles, unto every believer that is followed thereafter. That ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to God. Because, hey, as sinners, you got a problem with God. As sinners, you deserve a punishment of hell. But there's a way to be reconciled with God. There's a way for that to be made right. And it's only through Jesus Christ and the ministry of letting people know, hey, there's reconciliation. You need to get right with God by putting your faith in Christ. That's going to make things right. That's going to that's going to wash away your sins. That's what that's what you need to have done. That ministry of reconciling people with God. Hey, you've got a problem with God. You're on your way to hell. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got good news for you. I, I know how you can be reconciled. Here's here's the way. Here's the path. That ministry has been committed unto us. Verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Why well, say in Christ's stead? Because Christ himself isn't physically walking around anymore. So he's saying since he's not here doing that work, we are here. We're ambassadors. We're representatives. We're coming representing Jesus Christ. We're here ambassadors for God saying, hey, here's the plan. Here's the deal, right? You need to get saved. And we're representing Christ because he is not physically here. 
We need people to be represent, uh, excuse me, reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Turn to Romans chapter, well, you don't have to turn to Romans 10. Turn to, um, let's see, where are we at? I got my notes all out of order now. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Romans 10, of course, I already alluded to this earlier, a very famous portion of Scripture. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard, believed? Excuse me, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. Yeah, salvation comes by believing. Right? Believing what? The word. But how are people going to hear that word? How are they going to hear without a preacher? Explain that one to me. Yeah. You need a preacher. We're not just mailing off Bibles to people and just drop shipping them all over so that everybody gets a Bible in their hand and expecting them to get saved that way. Because right. it's not going to happen. That's right. It's yeah. not going to happen. Because the way that God designed things is that he wants us doing the work. Yep. He did the work for us. Now he wants us to be laborers for him. Acts chapter 8, again, famous passage, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. Acts, 30, Acts 8, verse 30, so the Bible reads, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So here's a man that's unsaved in his chariot reading the Bible. Yeah. And not only is he reading the Bible, he is reading a part that is just so perfect yeah. Yeah. to be able to understand the gospel, to be able to understand salvation and i'm going to turn there myself because it's it's in the passage it tells us the place where he was it says in verse 32 the place of the scripture which he read was this he was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer so opened he not his mouth and his humiliation his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. The eunuch didn't understand it at all. He didn't get it. And it's not a big surprise, turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it's not a big surprise that he didn't get it because he's not saved. He's not understanding the word of God because he's not saved. So how do you expect someone to get saved from a book that, that requires you to be spirit to have the spirit to understand it. Right. Yeah. Your blinders are still on. You need someone to explain it to you, just like he said, and he said, how can I accept some, some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Yeah. So how can I understand this? I need someone to explain it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because as 1 Corinthians 2 says, verse 11, the Bible reads, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. We couldn't understand God's word until we were born again. We needed someone else to, to bring that reproduction forth in us. We needed to be born again to really start to understand God's word. Now, the natural man, what God has allowed him to be able to understand is the gospel through the preaching, through the Holy Ghost, giving him that understanding. When they hear the word of God, it could be explained unto them, but they're not going to just pick it up on their own and just understand it. They need somebody to teach it because the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. This is why the Spirit of God needs to be involved directly with a soul winner. Last place I'm going to have you turn, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is one, just one more evidence, because I went out of order on my sermon. 
with the, the corrupt tree not being able to bring forth good fruit. And just one more evidence and proof that the fruit that he's referring there to are the converts. Because this is used not in a negative light of understanding who the false prophet is, but in a positive light of, of, of um, justifying or, or the evidence for the Apostle Paul that he references in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? So what he's saying is, you know, do we have to commend ourselves, meaning to give themselves some credit, right, of saying, well, you should listen to us because whatever, right? Because I went to Bible college and I've got a master's of, of divinity and theology and, you know, or, you know, he says as, as other people, letters of commendation, right? Like, oh, listen to these guys are good. Someone else vouching for them. Yeah. Yeah. But he's saying, we don't need that. I don't need that. Why doesn't he need that? Because verse two says, ye are our epistle. You are our letter. Good. You're that letter of commendation. You are. Because you're the fruit. You're the people that we brought forth. So you are representing the fruit of my ministry. Yeah, yeah. Me going forth and winning you to Christ and you being in church and you living for God. Hey, that's my letter of commendation right there. Amen. Look at this group of people here that's serving the Lord. That's my letter of commendation. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts. You don't need it written on a piece of paper. It's written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of a living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also may have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. The converts are the epistles of the apostle. That's how you're going to know. That's the letter of commendation. Because that's the good fruit. Because you know what? A bad tree, they can't bring forth that good fruit. Yeah. They can't do it. So when you see a whole church full of people that a, that a, a prophet has preached the gospel to and is one to Christ, and is teaching and leading, you know what? When you see what they're doing, and you can see their fruits, and you see what's going on in that church, that's going to give you an idea of, of the prophet of that tree that's reproducing, that's bringing forth proselytes, right? A proselyte's a convert. And which is also why Jesus said when he was railing on uh, the false prophets, the scribes, the Pharisees, the hypocrites in Matthew 23, Right when he was really just just digging into them and, and letting them have it, he says that they may they go um, they can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Yeah. Why? Because they're a child of the devil. You know what? All they could do is bring forth other children of the devil. Right. Yeah. Right. That's all they can do. Now they're making proselytes, no doubt. Yeah. But they're bringing forth children of the devil. Not children of God. Children of God go forth and beget other children of God. Children of the devil bring forth children of the devil. Good trees bring forth good fruit. Bad trees bring forth bad fruit. Yeah. And there is no crossover. There is no mix. Right. It's completely distinct and separate. That's how you know. That is how you can know. And this is why, you know... I always teach people that, that are under my preaching, be careful with where you get your, your teaching from because you can have 10,000 instructors in Christ. But when you just read books or kind of see people up on YouTube and you don't know anything about them, you don't know anything about their ministry, you know, you're just hearing things, be very careful, be very weary of that. Yeah. Okay? I'm not saying you just can't listen to anybody. Right? I, I don't believe that. I'll listen to people, and you've got to be able to judge everything against the word of God. But at the same time, just be careful. I always like seeing the fruit of the ministry before I really kind of dig into the, to the teaching and, 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 and be able to hear and listen to what people are saying because um, that, that is the letter of commendation. Yeah. It's the epistle written in the hearts. Amen. 
we've got a few minutes. I'm gonna I'm gonna close on this because again, it, you know, the problem I have isn't just with the the average person who's saying, well, no, I still think the word of God is enough to you know for someone possibly to get saved, right? As some outlying case, like someone had no one there, they had a Bible, they got saved. That's not what I'm concerned about. But there's other ramifications once you start going down that path, and you got to think these things all the way through to the end yeah. of, of how this stuff plays out and how it works. And those, those one-off cases that you might, you know, it's, it's just like someone trying to bring up the, the random person who lives in the middle of no, you know, like, who are these people? You don't know who they are. Right. You don't even know for sure if they exist. Because you wouldn't know where a person is unless someone's already known about them. And they've had contact with someone in the outside world. Right? So it's all just hypothetical anyways that there's this person who's never heard of Jesus Christ. Well, how do you know that? Because as soon as you find them, why don't you tell them about Jesus Christ? And, and all of a sudden, there it is. They, they've heard about Jesus. Imagine that. I'm going to try to blow through these verses because we've got, we got a little bit of time. Matthew chapter 4. And you don't have to follow these. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the seas and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 11, 5. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, whosoever, this gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Mark 1, 14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Mark 13, 10. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. Published meaning preached. Okay, it's not just writing a book and publishing. I mean, published means you're spreading it abroad, far and wide. Mark 14, 9. Whosoever, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. Mark 16, 15, go ye in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Luke 7, 22, and to the poor, the gospel is preached. Luke 9, 6, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Luke 21, again, these are all partial verses. I don't want to read all of it. And preached the gospel. Acts 8, 25, and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Acts 14, 7, and there they preached the gospel. Acts 14, 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra. Acts 15, 7, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts 16, 10, that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Acts 20, 24, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Romans 1, 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Romans 15, 9, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Romans 15, 20, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Romans 16, 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. We have to preach the gospel. Woe unto you if you don't preach the gospel. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Dispensation means you have to be giving out the gospel. That's committed unto you. You are required to, to, to preach the gospel. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. I abuse not my power in the gospel. You, you see a trend here yeah. with the gospel in the Bible? It's not saying any other method at all of people getting saved than you preaching the gospel. Amen. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. Why, why was Paul traveling all over the world? Because he was preaching the gospel. Why? To get people saved. Because that's how people get saved. 2 Corinthians 10, 14. 
For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. 2 Corinthians 11, 17, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Galatians 1, 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, you have preached, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach, preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Galatians 2, 2, and I went up by revelation and communicated with them that the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. Galatians 3, 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heaven, the heathen, excuse me, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Yeah, the gospel was preached unto Abraham. It was preached unto Abraham. There's always been ministers by whom people believe. Preaching the gospel is vital. We're almost done here. I'm going to get through these last few verses. Galatians 4.13, you know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 6.19, and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel, because people don't know how to be saved, so we need to open up our mouths boldly to preach the mystery of the gospel so that you can help people understand it. Yeah. 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. You're being put in trust. God is trusting you with the gospel. To preach the gospel to preach the gospel and not rely on people getting saved by any other means by you than by you preaching the gospel Amen. first Thessalonians 2 9 for you remember brethren our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable on any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God Hebrews 4 2 for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them he's talking about people who are saved versus unsaved he's talking about unbelieving Israel hey Gospel was preached unto us. So yeah, the disciples, the apostles, they had the gospel preached unto them as well as unto other people, as well as unto them. But the word preach did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Yeah. Gospel's being preached. Not everyone's going to receive it, but the gospel is being preached and needs to be preached in order for people to receive it. 1 Peter 1.12, of course, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Preached with the Holy Ghost. First Peter 1 Peter 1.25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. First Peter 4 6, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. That's why the gospel was preached, that they might live according to God in the Spirit. Revelation 14 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. I think the Bible's clear. I don't think we need to waste time trying to figure out, well, I mean, theoretically, if someone was all by themselves on an island and all they had was a Bible, can that person get saved? Hey, preach the gospel! Amen. Bring forth the word of God like the Bible has instructed you to over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and stop wasting your time with foolish questions. Amen. This is how God designed it. Let people be brought forth. Labor and travail. Bring forth new life. Bring forth that birth. That's why we are here. And praise the Lord for this church here in Oklahoma City because there's a light here to shine in the darkness. Because you know what? Yeah. If this church wasn't here preaching the gospel, there's a lot of people who wouldn't be getting saved. That's right. Right. How many people is it already this year? 33 or something? I saw the number in the, in the bulletin. Somewhere around there. I mean, the year's just started. Amen. You know what? Those 33 people that called on the name of the Lord to get saved, it wouldn't have happened 
if you weren't out there preaching the gospel unto them. They would not have pulled the Bible off their shelves and started reading and going, oh, I think I'm just going to get saved now. It wouldn't have happened. So don't let all this, this foolishness distract you from the job that you have to do. Because at the end of the day, that's just going to lead to laziness. It's going to lead to just forsaking it and your gospel being hid and your gospel being hid to them that are lost. I'm not saying that people who believe that it's just, you know, I'm not saying they're unsaved. I'm not saying they're bad people or anything like that. Okay, I'm not not saying that. But this is a very, very, very basic fundamental doctrine that is just so clear in Scripture. And when I kind of hear these things going on, this is one of those things I'm like, you know what? This just needs to be nailed down. The concept of bringing forth people and that new birth and being born again and how that happens. It's so simple and basic. You know what? We need to be solid on that. Because we can't have anything dissuading us from the work that's before us. The gospel needs to be preached into all the world. Let's not (laughs) be distracted on the, on the foolish questions. Bottom line. As far as I've ordered prayer, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this the new birth, for, for saving our souls, for, for paying for us, dear Lord. God, and we thank you and we're humbled that you've committed such a great task unto us, Lord, that, I mean, we're not even worthy to be saved, yet you've, you've given us and entrusted us with, with such a great task as a bringing forth salvation unto others. Lord, I pray that you would please Help us to, to clean up our vessels, that we can be vessels unto honor, that you can use us the more abundantly, and that, and that we could bring forth more fruit unto you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just bless this church, bring forth more laborers into this church, dear Lord, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area, Lord, and that you would just, just help all of us to do better, help us to strive to be pure in our doctrine. I pray that you would please just lead us, guide us, and help us to, to bring forth that glorious light into a dark world. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.